On April 8th, 1992, one of the greatest athletes the world has ever seen announced that he had AIDS. No, I'm not talking about Magic Johnson. That was HIV. And the year before, on November 7th, 1991. But remember that date, because it'll be important later. The man on screen is Arthur Ashe, one of the greatest tennis players to ever live. And this is Black Friday. Let's go back in time. In 1943, Arthur Ashe Jr. is born to Arthur Ashe Sr. and Manny Cordell Cunningham Ashe. Shortly after, his parents bring home his little brother Johnny. Unfortunately, Manny died during a third pregnancy due to preeclampsia, an issue that many pregnant women still face today. It causes high blood pressure and can lead to seizures, stroke, and all kinds of other bad stuff. Even today, black American women are still almost twice as likely to be diagnosed with. After Maddie's passing, Arthur Sr. took on three jobs and raised the boys as a single father. One of those jobs was as caretaker policeman for Brookfield Park. It was the largest park for black people in the state of Virginia. Because of his role as caretaker, the family was provided with a small home on the edge of the park. This allowed the boys to be introduced to all kinds of different sports. Now, Arthur Sr. was a man who didn't play around. Arthur Jr. is quoted as saying, There was no gray in daddy's world. His rules were black or white, without regard to race, and there was a time when I feared him. He was very strict, almost overprotective, and it was understandable. He had lost a father and a wife in less than 12 months. He did not want to lose his children for any failure to follow orders. Back to Arthur Jr. At the age of seven, he spots some people playing tennis and becomes obsessed with the game. One day he's noticed by Ron Charity, a college student, but also a tennis instructor. Arthur already has the passion, but Charity helps him to build the skills required. He's also the person who introduces Arthur to tournament play. At the age of 10, Charity takes Arthur to meet a man named Robert Johnson. No, not the BET Robert Johnson, and not the blues singer either. This Robert Johnson was a standout college football player who went on to coach. Then he attended medical school and became the first black person to earn the right to practice medicine in Lynchburg, Virginia. But Johnson also found a love for tennis. He would become a tennis coach. He'd also go on to found American Tennis Association Junior Development Program for African American Youth. That is an insane trajectory and it doesn't sound like it, but he was actually a pretty good tennis coach. One of his first students was Althea Gibson, who is credited with not only breaking down segregation in the sport, but being a hero to Venus and Serena Williams. Back to Arthur. In 1958, the community rallied around Arthur and the Maggie L. Walker High School so that the boys' tennis team would be the first black team to play in the Maryland Championships. They came through and crushed the building, taking first place with these. When 1960 rolls around, he's just too good. Robert Johnson makes a phone call to Richard Hudlin, a 62-year-old teacher and former tennis coach. He extends an offer to house Arthur in St. Louis, Missouri, where the sport has already been integrated. Each day, Arthur practices at the National Guard Armory and just dominates tournament after tournament after tournament. In 1960, he makes the cover to Sports Illustrated, and again in 1963, before he's even left high school. For college, Ash attends UCLA, where he's a member of Kappa Alpha Psi, you know, Red, Stripe Games, Divine Nine, all that good stuff. Despite the fact that he's already a national champion at this point, he's told there are no scholarships available. So he does what a lot of people do. He joins the ROTC to guarantee free tuition as long as he completes four years of service after graduation. The best part of college for Arthur was meeting his hero, Ricardo Gonzalez. Here's a picture with Ash, Gonzalez, and Gordon Parks at a charity game. For now, let's pause and talk about Ricardo Gonzalez. Despite having a reign as the top ranked tennis player in the world, you will get no results searching for Ricardo Gonzalez or even Ricardo Gonzalez tennis. That is because Ricardo is Mexican American. So the media chose to constantly refer to him as Pancho Gonzalez and tell stories about him getting in knife fights as a child, which is why he had a scar on his face. In reality, he got the scar as a kid from crashing a scooter. Despite four grand slams, a number one ranking, over a thousand wins, 
numerous tournaments won, he still died poor without being recognized by his real name. Sometimes I wonder if Arthur knew that one day the media would treat him with the same disrespect they did Gonzalez. Throughout college, Arthur stacks up wins, eventually playing in the Australian Open. He loses, but now he wants to win on the big stage. After graduation, Arthur begins his service in the army. He continues winning tournaments, but to maintain amateur status, he has to turn down prize money. In 1968 alone, he wins 10 of the 22 tournaments he enters. He goes 72 and 10 on the year. He's ranked number three in the world. Still, when he applies to play in the South African Open, he's denied a visa. He uses this to call out apartheid, and despite tennis officials meeting with South African Prime Minister John Vorster, uh, they didn't back down, and Ash is forced to sit out that year. The cherry on top of all that is that he's drafted for a two-year tour in Vietnam. Remember his little brother Johnny? Well, Johnny was already in Vietnam, finishing up his own tour duty. He spots the paperwork with his brother's information and signs up to serve his term because he didn't feel Arthur needed to go to war. See, Johnny does this without telling anyone except their father. As far as Arthur knows, they saw his tennis skills and chose not to take him. They keep that secret between the two of them for 18 years. In an interview with UCLA, Johnny stated, if I had come back when I was supposed to, Arthur would have had 14 to 15 months left on his enlistment, which was enough time for him to go to Vietnam. This is my idea. Totally my idea. I didn't talk to anyone about it. Arthur was a very strong-willed man, but he was also a gentle spirit, and I didn't want the experience of war to change that. In 1973, Arthur finally gets an invite to South Africa, becoming the first black person to play in their national tournament. He demanded that the crowds not be segregated, or he would refuse to play. So, the crowds weren't segregated. But when he wants to spectate games he isn't playing in, he's forced to buy tickets for them at the Africans only counter. The experience in the country leads him to struggle through the tournament and he goes home upset even after coming in second. Back home, after years of speaking out, he officially joins the boycott of South Africa. In 76, at a benefit dinner for the United Negro College Fund, Arthur meets and falls in love with Jenny Matusevi, an award-winning photographer and artist. She had been inspired to pursue photography by Gordon Parks, who had been impressed by her work for news stations. Today she's won countless awards and has permanent collections on displays around the country. One private display is in the possession of Oprah Winfrey, who was never shy about being a fan. At age 35, Arthur has a foot injury and is ranked much lower than he's ever been ranked. How low? Number 800. The talk is that he should just retire. He doesn't have it anymore. He's got nothing left to prove. Now, hold up, wait a minute. They thought he was finished. He returns from injury and goes on a winning streak, raising his rank from 800 to number 13. The biggest jump in rank ever seen at that point. But... There isn't a storybook ending here. His career wasn't destined to continue. In December of 1979, while out on a jog, Arthur suffers a heart attack. Just five days prior, Arthur Sr. had survived a heart attack of his own. In April, Arthur retires from the sport of tennis, but he doesn't just walk away into the sunset. Arthur places a focus on the importance of heart health because if a peak athlete could suffer a heart attack, nobody is immune. He's doing advertisements, late night TV shows, magazines, and attacking with the same focus and dedication he did tennis. In 1983, he has a second heart attack. During the surgery, he requires a blood transfusion. But everything else goes fine. Without taking a break, he's back fighting for civil rights. In 1985, he's arrested for protesting outside the South African embassy. Because, rightfully, he's not letting that apartheid thing go. In 1988, he's admitted to the hospital because his arm has become paralyzed. They run tests, and it's revealed that he's got toxoplasmosis, the most common nervous system infection for those suffering AIDS who aren't receiving medication. 
They run another test. It comes back positive for AIDS. It's traced all the way back to the blood transfusion he received in 1983. At the time, AIDS was a death sentence. Arthur and Jeannie choose to keep the diagnosis a secret. Not because they're afraid of public backlash or rumors, but because they've got a daughter. And they don't want her to suffer because of the stigma placed on people with HIV and AIDS, as well as their loved ones. He fights the disease in silence while finishing two books, A Hard Road to Glory, The African American Athlete, and Days of Grace, a memoir about his life. He's still marching for civil rights and promoting heart health. As the kids say, he's booked and busy. In early 1992, Arthur gets a call from a friend who worked for USA Today. The friend heard a rumor and looked into it himself. The rumor turned out to be true. After the story of Magic Johnson's HIV diagnosis in November of 91, they went on the hunt because they were eager to break a story too. USA Today had somehow learned of Arthur's AIDS diagnosis and planned to release it as front page news. For the next several days, Arthur lives in a state of chaos and panic that he had never known before. He and Jeannie are rapidly calling family and friends explaining what happened and how. Then he and Jeannie make a decision that will change the world. They decide to call a press conference before the USA Today story can run. That's where this video started. In a heartfelt speech, flanked by family and friends, including Jeannie, New York City Mayor David Dinkins, his doctor Henry W. Murray, Arthur announced to the world that he had AIDS. He didn't have to do this, but he didn't want his family and friends to quote, hear about it on the radio and TV. He goes on to thank the medical community that kept his diagnosis secret for years. He also expresses some optimism for getting on with his life, but he wasn't without strong words for the media. I'm angry that I was put in the unenviable position of having to lie if I wanted to protect my privacy. Still, I didn't commit any crimes and I'm not running for public office. I should have been able to reserve the right to keep things like this private. He would go on to say, up until this time, I sleep every night. No problem. Last night was difficult. USA Today didn't deny they intended to run the story. And this was a time when poor journalism got you shamed, not a job on TV. They were shunned by other media outlets, the public, politicians, celebrities, and athletes all refused to do interviews with them. Despite what he had been through, it didn't stop him. Later that year in September, Arthur is arrested outside the White House for demanding that deportation of Haitian immigrants be stopped. He has a third heart attack, but still goes on to speak at the United Nations about the HIV and AIDS crisis. Two months before his death, he funded the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Healthcare to help fight the lack of health clinics in black neighborhoods. When he died on February 6, 1993, between six and 8,000 people traveled to Virginia to mourn him. I think we should all remember Arthur Ashe, not because he won a lot or because he was great at tennis, but because it takes a community for a person to be great. He never turned his back on the people that helped him. He kept fighting for others like him until the end. Even when the media intended to make him a pariah, it didn't stop him. That's nothing short of admirable. That's all I got for today.